Okay, welcome once again to Krillionaire Crypto Chat. We're having a chat today about the Celsius Network. And the Celsius Network is the first blockchain-based borrowing and lending platform designed to act in the customer's best interest. It sounds like a contradiction. It's actually a bank that's working for you. The Celsius Wallet app provides members with access to curated financial services not available through the traditional institutions. So we have with us this morning or this afternoon, the Head of Strategic Partnerships for Celsius Network. And Leah Jonas has played a key role in the growth and success of the company since its early stages. In fact, over the last year, Leah has spearheaded the integration of staking services into the Celsius wallet, as well as building out white label partner programs, allowing wallets, custodians and exchanges to offer their users, wait for it, interest bearing accounts. So you can actually earn interest on your crypto. It's amazing. Celsius right now has over $2 billion in loans and over $300 million in crypto assets. Loans, if you're looking to get a loan against your crypto, start around about 4.95%. And if you're just one of the holders, the hodlers, then you can actually earn up to 10%. Again, it's like a bank for your crypto, but around 80% of the profits go back to you. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Leah Jonas. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for having me. Um, it's, a, it's an honor. So it's kind of like a bank, but it's not a bank. So tell us where Celsius is different. Yeah, I think that um, that's a great description. <laughs> um, there's really no other way to describe it. It's, it's really, um, it's the ability to be a transparent bank. And that's really what we're, we're aiming to be. It's, it's pulling back the curtain on the financial service industry that we all participate in today. Um, but we're not quite aware how to make it work for us. Um, so I think that Celsius's mission overall is to provide financial freedom through things like passive income, um, interest to, or uh, access to credit, um, access to loans, that kind of stuff, just to as many people as we possibly can, um, whether they are deemed worthy in the traditional financial system currently, or they may be deemed unworthy. That's the bigger goal, right? So but we're, we're talking about people with bad credit and, and things like that, right? Yeah, bad credit or, you know, unbanked and underbanked areas. I think that uh, that's a really big mission of the crypto space is to get into those hundreds of millions of people who just are not deemed worthy you know there's mm -hmm. there's banks that are just not going to go to rural uh south america or rural africa and set up a branch um because why would it benefit them they just they, they wouldn't make enough money for the shareholders so um there's kind of a perfect storm right now of technology and um financial services provided by crypto and blockchain that really allow uh, entrepreneurs and, and tech uh, and innovative technology to go out and reach those people and provide them um, with the same financial services that, you know, we have here in the Western world. Yeah. So primarily the business is sort of borrowing and lending. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess there's people out there, there's some people who got into Bitcoin, you know, way back in like 2010, 2013, and they've been yeah. sitting on this pile of Bitcoin for many years. The there's, some people, <laughs> there's some people who have only recently got into it. Yeah. And you know, a, lot of, a lot of our audience will be the ones who are holding onto their, onto their digital assets and just holding yeah. and sometimes they go up, sometimes they go down. You think, well, yeah. it's really, what's it going to be worth in five years' time? What's it going to be worth in 10 yeah. years' time? But yeah. you're actually bringing a service to these people where they can actually borrow against that and mm -hmm. use that either for, for further investing or do you actually put some criteria over what they should do with the funds? No. Um, I mean, obviously, we do full compliance KYC. Um, we want to make sure our community is safe um, and that's our, our goal first and foremost. But I've had, I mean, actually, I've, I've wanted to do something internally where we kind of talk to some of our biggest borrowers because we have borrowers that come back again and again. Um, we have a great lending team. They're, uh, you know, in texting terms with some of our, our borrowers. So they have borrowed from everything 
from a like a vet visit for their dog when they needed surgery to uh, doing their own documentary um, to a million different things. Um, so no, we don't. We don't. You don't have to qualify. You don't have to sit here and explain to us or justify why you need a loan. Um, I think that if it's your money, then you deserve to do what you want with it. I I went through that when I moved to New York. I had to try to qualify for a loan, mm. and I'm sitting there and going through a list of questions. And I'm like, will this be judged a certain way? Will this be judged a certain way? Yeah. And that's just silly. I mean, it's, you know, uh, it's up to someone else to just determine what I do with my money. That's mm. it's not a world I want to live in. <laughs> so they don't have to reinvest. Like you don't have to borrow against your Bitcoin and buy Ethereum or something like that. You literally go on a holiday, buy a motorbike, whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we are, um, have very safe LTVs, probably more, our loan to value um, is pretty high. So we want to make sure that, you know, we're not uh, risking the, the entire pool by, by giving someone uh, a loan one-to-one -one against their Bitcoin and it drops and anything like that. Um, but as long as it falls within the requirements, then no, go to buy a motorbike. Like, <laughs> go do whatever you want with it. Um, and it allows you to hold on to that asset longer term um, and kind of go live your life in the meantime. Yeah, I, I think there's, there's an important thing there because depending on which current country you're in, like I'm sitting in Australia at the moment, you're in, you're in Tel Aviv, we're talking about the New York office. But um, you know, if, if you've had a Bitcoin for the last you know, six, seven years, and it's yeah. gone up massively in value, if you sell that, then that could trigger yeah. a tax event. So yes. if you say, look, I don't want to sell it because if I, if I sell it to pay for the dog's operation and then you know, the week later the Bitcoin goes through the roof, I'm going to miss out. But yeah. obviously having the ability to not sell the Bitcoin, you don't miss out on the, on the fluctuations and you don't actually trigger yeah. a tax event. So I think that's an important point as well. Yeah, that's actually an interesting thing to bring up. We do see a lot of that. Um, we do see a lot of people borrowing for tax purposes. Um, and even more so now that we have stable coins. Um, so because we will uh, provide a loan in stable coins, um, instead of having to come back to the coffer again and again, um, you know, say you have a collateral, you take a 20% loan, you can take a larger loan in stable coins and then basically you're still deferring taxes um, on that uh, underlying Bitcoin, but you also can pull down from that stable coin when you want or convert it back to crypto when you need, right? So if you're a frequent trader or you want to keep most of your money in the ecosystem, um, you can actually get it back into crypto much easier. So we, we've seen that um, quite often. Okay. Uh, you, you mentioned LTV before, loan to valuation. In, in Australia, we call LVR, loan to valuation ratio. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, that, that, that's fine. Uh, just a little, little bit of kind of banking jargon. Exactly. But... Um, we also, so some people are aware of fractional reserve banking where the bank can literally take a deposit of like $100 and then lend out $1,000. Mm -hmm. And when that ratio was out of whack, that's why we saw, you know, banks in, in America going, going broke and, and banks in Europe going broke with the GFC because they were lending out, you know, multiple times what they actually right. had literally in, in, in the bank. So yes. because Bitcoin arose because of people's dissatisfaction with the GFC, can you explain your loan valuation ratio, why it's not as risky as, as the banks? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that, you know, crypto was really born out of this financial crisis that we all witnessed and went through. Um, and it's really important that we learn from history and not repeat it. Um, so I think that, blockchain technology and crypto provide this unique, this unique opportunity to kind of put our money where our mouth is. Because if you truly open up banking in terms of transparency and pull back the current on the financial services that are only known to a small fraction within, I'll just talk about the US market since I know it, like just a very small fraction 
of the overall population within the U.S. understand what happens when you put your money in a bank account. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem because if you don't know what's happening, you can't demand transparency. You can't demand accountability. You can't make money off of it the way that you should, the way that that the bank is. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's up to us to kind of pull back that curtain. And luckily we live in a time where blockchain is here and you have the ability to pull back that friend. I can trace a transaction from deposit to Wall Street, right? Hypothetically, if, if mm-hmm. I wanted to, I could trace it all the way. I could see exactly, you know, what it was lent out for. I could uh, maybe get in front of some of the risky behaviors that Wall Street was doing because I was like, well, this it's like a weird thing you're selling. Um, but that's really what our, our goal is. And in doing so, it's important to us that we start off with those best practices, even before auditing of financial services becomes the norm, which is what we hope, right? Um, even though right now, your mom might not know what Bitcoin is, and my mom might not know what Bitcoin is, um, or this guy in the street doesn't, um, doesn't mean that you don't have to start with a foundation of where you want to be. Um, and I think that a lot of the industry doesn't understand that. They're like, let's get away with what we can at this point. And that sounds very reminiscent of the GFC. Wall- yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. It sounds very reminiscent of Wall Street. So what we do is we are not over leveraged um, anywhere um especially in in terms of how we give out loans to um retail i think we're at like 200 percent um most times or our ltv is about 50. Mm -hmm. um and we also publish all of our transactions and will continue to make it user friendly to do audits on us so you can see exactly what we have um on hand and what we have lent out and um you can feel safe knowing that, you know, if Bitcoin dropped, this is the reserve that we have. Like this is, this is how we do our automation. We built an entire proprietary back office for that. So our goal is to set an industry standard um, and take action before anybody else. Like we shouldn't have to have the entire population demand that, are that their services, their centralized services, like are held accountable or act in their interest, um, they should do that in order to win the business. Not you have the business and now you're demanding uh, that your your institutions act ethically. Like, ethically, yes. that's, <laughs> like that's, that's crazy. So uh, yeah, I think that, that you'll see more and more of that and we'll, we hope to be on the forefront of introducing that to the industry. Well, as, as you said before, like the blockchain brings a transparency where you can track you know, every amount of, of whatever that's moving through this right. space and call it dollars for, for want of a better term. This right. space. When, I, when I was a kid, I used to think, okay, like I put $100 in the bank and the bank is paying me 2% interest. Meanwhile, the bank has lent that $100 to somebody else and they're mm-hmm. paying five or 6% interest. And I go, oh, okay, I get that. I see where the bank is making their money. Right. And it wasn't until many years later when I realized that when I put $100 in the bank and I earn $2 interest, the bank might be lending out $100,000 and getting 6% interest. So they're making $6,000, not just $6, and then paying me $2. And when I discovered that, I was like, oh my God, yeah, these banks must be making billions of dollars every day. So when, when you say your, your LVR is safer and- than... What what are we looking at here? Because I, I know you're, you're paying you're paying massive amount. I, I can I can earn ten percent on my crypto. Yeah. How is that possible? Yeah. So there's there's two things here. I think that you address. One is the fact that that when you look at how much it's leveraged in in traditional finance, um, and people like you truly don't understand exactly um, how much is being earned, and I want to make a quick point that people don't quite understand about why the banks will never work in their interest um, and why will, they'll continue to take these risky behaviors. You are not 
the person that they're reporting to. They are reporting to their shareholders. True. So if you think that they're not going to cut any corner to make more money off of you, you are the product. Like you are what needs to be, uh, you're where their profit comes from and the profit goes to their shareholders. So no matter what, even if you said, oh, you know, I'm not going to name any names. <laughs> this bank, <laughs> XYZ, bank. <laughs> XYZ um, bank, you know, is doing this initiative to be more transparent or be more ethical. At the end of the day, they have to pay out their dividends and they have to earn money and they have to give it out. And you come second as a customer of that bank to what they have to pay to their shareholders. Where Celsius differs is we don't have that. We don't have a whole team of people that we're paying out dividends to. We're operating on a very, like an operational cost. Mm -hmm. And we give 80% of what we earn back to the community. Phenomenal. Yeah, that's, that's, that's something that you're never gonna see in traditional finance just because of how it's structurally set up. It, it can't work like that. Well, they've got their money in the bank earning maybe one or two percent if they're lucky, they right. wouldn't realize that the shareholders of the bank are earning, you know, six, nine, ten, twenty percent. Right. So and that that's where the bank's hands are tied. So really if you're looking at a model like ours where we are, I like to call it centralized decentralization in that I truly believe decentralization will come in waves. We're not quite ready to hold our own medical records yet or control our own data or do some of these complex financial services, but we are ready to maybe hold our own keys, cold storage, savings accounts, that kind of stuff. So I think that there's a sliding scale. And I think that when you look at products like Celsius, we are sitting in between traditional finance that wants to borrow these assets and trade with them. And who we report to is the users. Though our community is really what controls the coins that we add, the interest that we pay out, the people that hold us accountable, the role that shareholders hold in banks is what our community holds in our model. Mm -hmm. So they get most of the distributions, they vote with their feet. Um, you know, we hear a lot from them. We love our community. We talk to them all the time as much as we can. It's really important uh, to eat those internally to foster that communication and always listen to what what they need and want because they they're really the ones with the power to change the financial system we're just there as a tool for them to do so so would, would you say then every investor with celsius everybody who puts their money in automatically becomes an owner or a, or a shareholder of the bank 100 percent. yeah 100 percent. so you're really putting your money into a ecosystem in which Everybody gets treated the same, but also at the same time, every single person's 16 different assets across the board. Let's see, we have like five stable coins. We have 12 different cryptos, one staking coin. Um, so yeah, it, it definitely matters where they put their money because things like staking coins, which is something that I was really excited about to put in the wallet, if we get more deposits of staking coins and people who want to earn staking rewards on things that they can't qualify for on their own, then we will have more staking coins. Like that's just logical. So for um, because, people who haven't seen those before, like the, the staking coins, they're ones that where you're already earning some kind of return, correct? This is a great time to kind of go over what I like to call our risk appetite. If you were to come into Celsius, and say there's the coins like top 10, BTC, LTC, ETH, you know, XRP over here. Those are the ones that are being lent out. So we're taking collateral against it. They're verified funds. They're taking it for trading strategies, for hedging, for shorting, for a million different things. Market makers borrow from us, like a million different reasons to borrow crypto. So they're borrowing from us. They're putting collateral down with us. And we're taking that interest. We're at a blended rate because obviously some of these loans can last as little as two days and all the way up to 
eight months. It's it's all over the place. So we're taking that blind rate, we're distributing it to all of the people that hold that coin. And I would say that's a high risk appetite only because the coins are leaving our system, right? They're leaving the BitGo, even though we have collateral, there it's still higher risk than say staking coins. So staking coins like Dash are not leaving our system. They're held in nodes. We spin up Dash nodes and those Dash nodes each cost about, I think market value is about $100,000 and you cannot spin up a node until you have $100,000. So the barrier to entry for earning on Dash is very high. By myself, I can't go spin up a Dash node. I could hold $5,000 of Dash, but I would have no way of earning on it. So what we do is we allow fractional ownership, <laughs> much different than fractional reserve, fractional ownership of those Dash nodes in order for Dash users to deposit with us, we manage and spin up those nodes and they get the interest that they would earn if they say had a full node, mm -hmm. obviously prorated for what they have. But that, I would say that's medium risk, right? It's still crypto, it's still volatile. That being said, it is locked up in a node, it's not being traded and we can spin down those nodes whenever, right? It's number of hours, but they're in our custody. So then the, the third would be stable coins. And I think that this is the lowest risk profile just because basically you're taking your stable coins and we use that as we're lending those out. So that's against 200% collateral because of a 50% LTV, which is LRI. LVR. LVR. Not even close. <laughs> not even so, so to put it in real world examples, let, let's say, for example, I've got $1,000 worth of tether. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we don't I'd, take Tether. Okay. Well, stable coin. Uh, like uh, USDC. 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 So I, I put $1,000 with you and then say, I want to borrow because I want to go and buy some shiny new whiz bang, whatever it is. How mm -hmm. much can I borrow on the $1,000? Our loans are usually against crypto, like BTC, LTC, ETH, mm -hmm. not the not stable the coin. I guess right, we could right. do stable coins, but... It makes a lot more sense usually for people to do it against cryptos. You could borrow, I mean, with stable coins, I would have to probably talk to Tall. Top five. Um, so if a thousand dollars of Bitcoin or a thousand dollars of Ethereum, a thousand dollars of Bitcoin or a thousand dollars of Ethereum lodged, what could I borrow against that hypothetically? You could borrow about, yeah, like five hundred, six hundred dollars. We're gonna keep it, it depends on the volatility and what coin it is. So we have historical data on what those margin calls look like and then also if it goes up we'll give you more say when it jumped up and you were like you know what i want to use this just as a line of credit i mm -hmm. want to refinance to get another two hundred dollars cool that's up to you and we manage all of that uh programmatically so we have three different ways that if you were to get a mar margin call we would we could rebalance it and this is important to speak to your audience about because if they are shopping around for wait, ways to get loans against their crypto or companies to go with, one of the most important things I always say is look how they rebalance your margin call mm -hmm. because you, you can get in trouble there. <laughs> we allow you to just add more crypto in at about, say your loans at 50%, about 60%, we would give you a call. We have five or six hours, we balance it. So we can do a couple things. We can, we can sell some of your crypto that's in your uh, account to rebalance. We'll do that. Or you can add some more money in cash or crypto to rebalance. Isn't there are scary to some people who are going, oh my God, she's going to sell my crypto. This is the important part. We, we have a way in which that we only sell enough to rebalance it to 50%. Hmm. There are many companies that will liquidate at that point. If we and, compare it back to banks, like, so theoretic, theoretically in Australia, I can put down $25,000 mm -hmm. to buy a $500,000 house. Yeah. So I've, I've just borrowed 475000 which is a lot more, obviously, than the $25,000 yeah. I've put down. Yeah. And then if the housing market goes down, which it has done in the past, obviously GFC and, and that sort of stuff, the housing market mm -hmm. goes down, then the bank can literally sell a house and say, yeah. okay, that, that $500,000 house is now only worth 450. 
Uh, we've let yeah. you 475, we're going to take the whole house. And this is, this is where the, the fractional reserve banking gets you into trouble. But you're only lending out slightly less than what I've actually put down with you, which is a lot yes. safer. And this is a good time to bring up where it is today versus where I see it going in the future like, mm -hmm. um, in terms of in lending. So today we're dealing with a volatile market and we're building for the next 10 years, not the next year. So we have more conservative LTVs than other companies. Uh, we have much lower rates than other companies. We have probably the highest product offering in terms of number of coins that we allow you to earn on, stuff like staking, stuff like the other one. It's 16 but, coins. Yeah, 16. So, but that, that is all geared towards building long-term, right? There's many companies that might give you an 80% LTV, like 80% against what you put down, but that's going to cause a lot of unhappy people because they get liquidated. The market's just that volatile. So we were out, play it safe and sorry. That's today. In two or three years from now, we're not taking sides on what coin's going to win, right? There's some people who are Bitcoin maximalists. That's awesome. Some people who are Litecoin maximalists. Awesome. We built a system that doesn't play favorites. Our community will play favorites, right? Our community will be the ones that either deposit all in Litecoin, all in Bitcoin, whatever it is. So we're geared up to service the industry as a whole. And what that means is that let's just take an example where Bitcoin becomes like the money of the people. Um, there's God forbid, like corporate coins, um, like Libra, and then there's like state issued currency, like digital currency, like digital yen. So if we're looking at the future of what this looks like, if we were to see Bitcoin expand, you know, globally higher those LTVs, um, because it's more stable and we built out like the program algorithmically that would allow us to understand what LTVs we can give in order to stay within this safe zone so we're not giving margin calls. And ideally, what I see happening already in the industry is things like debit cards and credit cards coming up. And the ideal, in my mind, I'm just speaking personally right now, is that you have BTC that you bought in August 1st, 2019. And, you know, you kept it in the ecosystem and let's say you garnered, you know, we reached mass adoption three years from now and your fraction of a Bitcoin is now worth, you know, $50,000. Mm -hmm. You come to uh, Celsius and you have like a credit line against that underlying asset. You're basically not even touching it or, or transacting in it. And then you can transact in whatever you need, right? Whether that's I'm uploading, say like this month, I'm going to like China. And so I call up tall over here. Hopefully you're not calling tall. <laughs> Hopefully we, we've advanced beyond a like, you know, specific uh, loan relationship manager. But basically if you're, you're reaching out to Celsius and saying, hey, you know, I need an extra $5,000 against my credit this month and this is, I need it in digital yet. Yeah. And I'm able to enter and go and use that within their ecosystem while still holding that underlying asset. And it's just working as a line of credit for me. And I'm, I'm not transacting back and forth. I don't have to get my Bitcoin. I don't have to find people that are using Bitcoin. Now, that's a scenario that I could, I like to imagine. There's a million different scenarios. There's many people in this industry that would disagree that would say, we need to transact in Bitcoin only. There's many people who would say, Bitcoin's never gonna happen. I mean, that's just kind of par for the course in this industry. Everybody has a different vision. Even as you said before, there's, there's a lot of people who are unbanked. And you know, I'm, yeah. I'm old enough to remember 20 years ago when you, know, you go to, to some shops, you could actually go and pay with a visa card or a debit card and buy your petrol or buy your groceries but there was a lot of other shops that you couldn't because they didn't have fpos so you had to carry a mix you had some plastic and you had some cash and even traveling to other yeah. countries like in asia yeah. you have to have some cash as well as as, as as some plastic so i can imagine even in the next 10 or 20 years there might be a mum and dad fruit shop that don't accept bitcoin so you yeah. might want to have some local currency or, or some other yeah, you'll need an instant transaction, you mm -hmm. know, for sure. And and look, there will be 
there will need to be settlements. There's, there's so much that needs to happen in this industry, but there's so many cool opportunities. Um, I'll tell you one example for underbanked and unbanked because truly if you're entering this industry, underbanked and unbanked people get paid a lot of lip service, but there's not a lot being done, right? They're like, oh yeah, we're gonna un unbank everyone. I'm like, yeah, but you're still building exchanges. So like, <laughs> like they don't need exchanges. They, quite frankly, you know, it's very hard to convince someone who's been dealing with unstable currency for most of their life to go to another un unstable currency just because it's not a bank. I think that truly, if you look at one of the coolest examples that I've seen is there's all of these digital payment providers, like challenger digital payment providers coming up in undercovered areas, right? Where you're looking at South America, there's massive digital payment rails and people have digital wallets and they're paying, or M-Pesa, um, or you're looking at Africa, same thing. I think that you're seeing the infrastructure built for traditional finance to come in through challenger if you have a digital wallet that digital wallet you had a savings product and that savings product behind the scenes was a uh, stable coin account. low risk um it's audited you know usdc is audited by i think goldman or whatever or so it's 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 safe and those coins are it's true peer-to-peer -peer lending because you're able to take USDC from here, lend it to someone who has 200%, if backed by 200% collateral. But in doing so, this person over here who's unbanked or underbanked doesn't need a bank account. They're using a digital wallet and they're lending with instant access back to that, that money. And they're getting interest rates at even four or 5%. It is something they've never seen before in their life. Like what that's true passive income. That's the vision that I think for, I would love to see, right? And that's that's doable. That's physically doable today in this in this market. And I think you'll see it pop up a lot more. Those are the kind of solutions that we need to start confronting. Educating, I truly believe that educating the entire world that Bitcoin's awesome is gonna be really tough. There's, yeah. my aunt has five kids. She can't even sit down and she lives in a world in which she can get water from her tap and she can go to the grocery store. So she still doesn't have time to sit down and learn about Bitcoin or crypto. Like you think that someone who needs to walk to get water or works on a farm, like they're going to sit down and take Coinbase's classes? Like probably <laughs> not. Like, <laughs> I think you have to give, you first have to give a use case and give uh, unparalleled benefit and once you start to prove the worth in their everyday life then you start to garner interest by those people who are getting the benefit yeah i mean even even a stable currency as you say is going to be a massive thing for, for some of these people in in emerging countries and i've been okay. through asia and africa where we've seen massive inflation and you know there's in billions of, of dollars and things like that the so venezuela zimbabwe these these sort of countries where not only they're not making any money on on the amount in their bank but the amount in their bank is actually reducing because the prices are skyrocketing i think that south america and you can quote me on this um everybody's talking about asia and entering you know that market and um it's really big in crypto but south america and central america are hotbeds and it's a powder keg and it is going to be one of the most innovative tech regions in the world in 10 years like i think it will truly be the gateway for so much emerging tech tech built for social good tech built for everyday use proximity to the united states is great and look we need to be held accountable by people that can actually vote with their dollars um, to not make any more chatbots. Silicon Valley should not be making any more chatbots um, or any more like products for themselves. I think we need to branch out and start building tech for people that truly, you know, need it and bring them into that world. And in order to do that, you have to give them 
access to money so that they can vote with that money and they can provide the the user adoption that is necessary for companies to say wait a second i need to build something for all of these people over here as opposed to these 10 people here because does that make sense like instead of building something for 10 people within your upper class northern california um i'm going to build something for all of these people within you know the central american market because they're accessible via the digital rails. They can spend money on X, Y, Z relatively. That's a bridge that's gonna be crossed relatively soon of entering that market and really being able to, to build those services out for the developing tech world. I wouldn't say developing world overall. There's many developed countries and cities there, but just really being able to provide the technical infrastructure for these emerging markets. Mm -hmm. I actually lived in Bali for a couple of years and yeah. you've got a hundred million people in Indonesia and it's, you know, it's an emerging, emerging economy. It's difficult to find yeah. a job there. So a lot of people end up starting their own businesses and they might be selling t-shirts or drinks or whatever. And there's mm -hmm. literally millions of people who are running their own businesses yeah. everywhere. 95% of them are not registered for taxation. Most of them, most of them don't have bank accounts. And yeah. I've got a friend who's been in business for like 20, 30 years. She's got multiple businesses and yeah. she's got a house, but she paid cash for her house. Wow. And she has a safe at home. She's never had a bank account. She's never qualified for bank lending. And it's just literally, she sells t-shirts and she does whatever she does. It's you know how much bank lending is in those areas? It's like 30%. <laughs> exactly. It's 30%. And the currency fluctuation is, is crazy. It's highway robbery. It's uh, like, I just... I don't even, I could go on about this for days because I, I was someone who in college, I never had credit cards, full disclosure. I just wasn't that good with, <laughs> with money when I was young. Um, but I didn't have credit cards. I didn't have car loans or anything. I didn't build any credit. And when I left college, no matter what my job was, no matter how good my grades are, no matter what position I was in, I had to get a credit card that had 24% APR. Mm because I just didn't have any credit. Like, that's insane. I had to prove to you, like, that I'm worthy of your money through paying you ridiculous amounts. Like, and you're, you're like, paying 24% interest, but as an investor, I'm, I'm still only making two. <laughs> I know, so you're making 2%, you're making I'm paying 24%. On top of all of that, we're sitting in a position where <clears throat> we're forcing people to get a 24% interest. I was straight out of college. Mm. I had like no money. The people who need that credit the most are forced into this vicious cycle of payday loans, um, predatory lending, high APRs, and they have no choice. Because in order for me to prove to the bank that I'm credit worthy, I have to pass this barrier. It's like, when did I become this thing that I have to prove myself to you before? Shouldn't it be the other way around? Should, like innocent, innocent until proven. Proven. Yeah, like I guess they just didn't take that one to heart. Just, uh, yeah, I, I think obviously um, the the Celsius network is going to be very valuable for people who may have bad credit because you know they weren't good with with credit cards when they were kids. They've got bad credit or they've faced bankruptcy or something like that. But mm -hmm. Also, from your perspective, you're protecting yourselves and us as the shareholders by making sure those people have got plenty of assets. So there mm -hmm. might not be a good credit risk, so-called, but as long as mm -hmm. they've got plenty of crypto or plenty of cash to back themselves, then you're going to back them as well. Yeah, and I think that you'll, you'll see that, I think, increase over time. And I think there's a lot of really innovative things that, that will come out in the next few years mm -hmm. to whether it's with Celsius or otherwise, to spread that wealth. People who have cryptos, who have access to these different types of like cheaper lines of credit, cheaper money. I don't know what that quite looks like, but I think that you will see people who have had this for a very long time when he wants to buy a house or like something as personal as that or more structured, I'm not sure. But I think that you will start to see this transition of people that are like, okay, this is such a 
uh, more beneficial option for me that I'm going to try to get in any way I can. And that might be baby steps, right? It might be, I put up half my collateral and someone else puts half my collateral up, right? So that I can reach that, the, the threshold LTV, but you have some sort of smart contract function where both people are alerted or there's a many different ways you can go about it. But the transition will be a long one and we have a long ways to go the whole industry, not just Celsius, but there's no way that as long as we're working in the best interest of the community and we're giving the best possible rates with interest and with borrowing, that's not going to happen. It's, it's like no brainer solutions, you know? So for, for our, our investors who are just sitting and holding mm -hmm. and wanting to earn, you know, six, eight, ten percent on, on their crypto, obviously Celsius is a great solution. Um, mm -hmm. I think we've covered off numerous times how safe it is compared to yeah. to other to other areas are you, are you able to tell us about any of the exciting things that may be coming in the next 12 to 18 months yeah so well two things one speaking to the investors that currently hold right? i always encourage people do what you're comfortable i've i have a lot of friends that have been in crypto for a very long time Andrea Santinopoulos is one of my favorite people and he is like godfather of not your keys or not your coins. I'm not saying take all your money and put it in Celsius. I'm saying put what you feel comfortable, earn some passive income, whether that's 1% of your holdings, 10%, 100% doesn't matter. We have zero minimum. So I think that trying it out and learning ways to earn money on that crypto definitely is a great way to make your crypto work for you. And earn um, if you're a long-term holder. That being said, I think there's a lot of really exciting things to come. I know that we are continuing to look into options of different staking coins, many of which have very high barriers to entry that you really can't earn on right now. We only are doing ones that we can work with those projects um, because we want the full endorsement just like we did with Dash. Um, so adding more coins to earn on is a big one. You know, going into new markets, obviously I have live in New York, but I'm here in Tel Aviv currently um, for some initiatives. I think that going into new markets is really important to us and in uh, serving new communities and growing it. What I'm most excited about is, as you mentioned at the forefront, um, taking our white label solution, mm -hmm. growing it, and providing it to the industry. Because quite frankly, you just might not like the color blue and you just don't want to hold with Celsius, right? Like we can't profess to be the end all be all of the best option for you. But what we can do is say the same way that if you walked into Chase Bank or you walked into US Bank or Santander, you would have an interest bearing account. Mm -hmm. You should be able to do that with any crypto wallet or custodian, right? The one that you trust the most, the one that you really feel safe with for whatever reason or provides you with the most services, right? We don't have a trading platform. You might want to have a trading platform. We don't have a atomic swap feature. You might want that. Yeah. My goal over the next couple of months um, into the next year is to be able to be that for that underlying infrastructure for wallets, custodians, exchanges, so they can provide their users with these services and access to these services. I think you'll see a lot of cross product coagulation. I don't know if that's the right word. <laughs> within collaboration, the industry. Rather than coagulation. collaboration is much better than co collaboration. Um, collaboration and I think that you'll see a standardized set of financial tools and services mm. that will be accessible like expected, I think that's what we're most excited for is to kind of be the on the forefront of that and leading that effort. Okay. So what, what's to stop me then with, with the white labels from actually starting my own little crypto bank? Because I can Nothing. borrow from you and lend to other people? Yeah, you can. We obviously have our, our APIs are currently public right now. They're on um, Celsius.networks backslash developer. So you can check them out. They are only accessible, the sandbox is only accessible through a partner token. You only get the partner token when we do commercial terms. Right now, the APIs are only accessible for uh, our wallet exchange institutional partners. 
Um, they will be accessible for retail soon, trust me. Not in the way that you're going to build a crypto bank by yourself without having an agreement with us, but more in the way that people want to pull data from their Celsius account. And I deal with those emails all the time, so don't worry. <laughs> there will be a way for you to uh, to build your own um, uh, thing if you're a developer and you want to uh, aggregate your data. But if you are a wallet and you want to, say, provide interest earning, you can white label our product. We do have commercial terms that, you know, I'm not going to let someone go and do what the banks are doing where they're providing 2% Bennett Africa mm. and they're taking 8%. You know, yeah. it's important for us, for all of our partners to align with us that's built into our commercial terms that we really we need to understand what their structure is, what their payout is and, and make sure that it as closely reflects reflects ours as as possible but no I, I have people all the time like I talked to this guy the other day who's like there's all these small businesses here in my town and I really want to build this interface for them to earn money until payroll because they have this money sitting there and I want to do it with stable coins and I was like awesome do it mm. we'll get a commercial term in place and you can set that up and as long as you build a ux ui and you service it as an omnibus account and their kyc then they tr they would trust you more than me coming mm. randomly and be like hey sign up for this like dentist that holds x amount until payroll like yeah. <laughs> you know and i love that i love that we have a, a community members that are so jazzed about this idea and so um, inspired by it, that they, it inspires them to go build out their own product because I truly believe that interest earning and passive income is something that everybody should have access to. And we don't hold the, the keys. We're not the end all be all. It's really the community that, that gets to take that and do what they want with it. You, you said there's no minimum. You don't charge a fee for, for setting up. And, and some of the loans are there for, for literally two and three days. So I'm thinking in addition to payroll, there's also a lot of businesses who set aside money every week or every month for tax purposes. And that might be sitting there for three months, six months. And it's, so, it's basically earning not much in the bank. So Yeah, so clarification, the two or three, like loans there for two or three days are usually institutional loans for trading. Mm -hmm. are, are loans that are like, that are against crypto. So if you're a retail user, you're taking a loan against crypto. We do have like a minimum of, I think, three or six months, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. And we don't charge a penalty for withdrawing, but there's a minimum interest requirement. So you can't like take a loan one day out for $100,000 against $200,000. But, and but as, as an investor, like if I'm, if I'm putting in, aside, you know, a couple of hundred dollars that I've got to pay so my tax, no, or a couple of thousand dollars, yeah. and I can sit there for a week. And I can still it can earn. Yeah, it can sit there as long as there's no minimum for, if you're earning interest, there's no minimum lockup. Right. Zero. We're the only ones that have no minimum lockup. And this is important to point out because people are like, how do you do that? And we're like, well, we don't deploy all our assets. Mm -hmm. We do, we have a pool that we have undeployed. And the reason why other competitors have not done that is because that is the biggest leverage point in the model, right? The more you can deploy, the more you can earn. Mm. That Those undeployed assets, we're taking a haircut on, essentially, because we're still paying out on them, even though they're undeployed. But they provide for ones out there with no minimum lockup. Um, so we, yeah, you can put in for two days, five days, 10 days, you know, whatever it needs to be. It, it's, a, it's a service for everyone, right? You can, you can love crypto and you can deposit the BTC. You can be underbanked or unbanked and deposit, you know, five dollars in stablecoin. Mm. Um, you can be a dentist in North Dakota, and you could have payroll sitting there for three weeks, and you could have it earn interest until that time comes. There's really Obviously no. Obviously, you don't no, do that with stablecoin if it's for a couple of weeks or, or a couple of months. You I wouldn't mean, do it with Bitcoin. Yeah. You could do it with Bitcoin. It but just not, not payroll it. I know exactly. I, that's I would say stablecoin because you don't want it to drop and then all of a sudden yeah. you're out. But but look, the point 
that we've made and why we really believe that this is a killer app and will garner a hundred, you know, mass adoption. And our goal that we're is drilled into the team here at Celsius since I started uh, over a year and a half ago is get to 100 million in users because there's not one person in this world that passive income doesn't apply to. Mm. There's some that don't have access to it. There's some that, you know, don't even know that you can earn passive income yet, but there's not one person that passive income doesn't apply to. It's beneficial for all, maybe on different levels, right? But everybody benefits from it. So it sounds like you have a huge heart for the for the unbanked. But yeah. You're, you're the new head of strategic partnerships. Is that carried right throughout the organization? Yes. Yeah. So I... How does that feel about that? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I believe I was employee number 10, maybe, maybe nine. But look, I I cannot find the words to express the, the level of commitment and admiration that I have to this company because of the mission that we have. Like, it is so, so, so deeply ingrained into every single team member here. It's, it's not even, it, like I said, it's, it's really hard to describe. I have traveled the world for this company. I feel incredibly grateful for this opportunity. I feel incredibly grateful to work under Alex. For your viewers that don't know, he's done seven startups, two IPOs, um, raised over 1 billion, exited over 3 billion. And this is his mission. Like he, it's, this is not about money. This is, this is legacy. This is, what is he gonna leave for his kids? He has six kids, by the way, which is just, but it's really something that I, when I get yelled at, if I get in trouble with Alex, it's because I'm not, it's because he's like, we are not doing this for anybody but the community. This is, this is not for this company or this is not to get clout here or, and it's really something that every single person that's hired on when I, when I meet someone in the company, um, they always ask that, right? Like, is this a, is this a narrative or is this a belief? And it's truly a belief in that every single day, I know for different reasons, everybody has their different, you know, aspects of our mission that they love the most, whether it's underbanked or whether it's, financial freedom, transparency, that kind of stuff. Every single person on the team is working towards the same goal um, in different ways for different reasons, but they're all working towards it. And that's what will make us successful because that's what will make us agile. And as long as you have your vision on that, your sight set on that one vision, you'll always figure out a way. But yeah, I, it, it's really it's electric, like our, our team. And I, I hope that we are able to keep that. I know how difficult that is in a startup, but yeah, it's a really special, uh, special moment um, to be part of. It, it sounds like a wonderful idea to help the unbanked. It sounds great for obviously mass, adop mass adoption of crypto. And from a purely capitalist point of view, it sounds great that I can just sit on my sit on my bitcoin whether it's going up down or sideways i'm still actually earning some interest on that so it's fantastic obviously yeah. by now everybody listening to this is madly in love with celsius and everything that you guys yeah. stand for so one thing we have to point out is celsius is actually c-e-l-s not c-e-l-c -E like the temperature yes yes yeah i i encounter that sometimes <laughs> um definitely c-e-l-s <laughs> so where where do, uh, We've got to spell C-E-L-S-I-U-S. -S. Where, where do we go to find out some more information? How do we sign up? How do we start earning money on our crypto? Yeah, definitely. So you can go to our website, um, Celsius.network. You can follow us on all the socials, um, Celsius Network Twitter, Alex Mashinsky is on Twitter, all the Instagram stuff. To sign up for Celsius, you just download the app to the Celsius Network on the App Store. And I... I'm a big fan of do your own research. So there's uh, 
a media page on our site. Um, you can learn all about us. We have a lot of information there. And, you know, I'll share my information. So, you know, Jeremy, you can feel free to post it. I'm an open book, um, for better or worse. <laughs> At this moment, I will, like, I'm more than happy to share my information, LinkedIn, whatever it is. I love questions. I love to uh, help people discover what that financial freedom looks like. And I'm always happy to talk to, whether it's a brand new person or someone who's been in it for a long time and is like, why would I use a centralized service to lend them on crypto or whatever question comes along. Fantastic. Well, congratulations again on becoming your new promotion. Yeah. Head of Thank strategic you. partnerships. Yeah. Compelled the Thank emotion you. that you that you feel for the project and the, and the passion that you have for the project. It sounds yeah. very exciting. So we're all going to rush off to Celsius.network. We're all going to download the app and transfer our cryptos across because we're all old, old school. We know how to do that. Or obviously there's there's Yeah, we're pros. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's there's people who will actually show you how to do that and start I, doing I have one piece of advice for anybody who's new to crypto that's listening to the show because it was something that someone told me at the very beginning. Um, if you want to learn, take one, like $10 and yeah. transfer it all the way from purchase to exchange to centralized service like Celsius, leave it there, just getting go yeah. to cold storage and all the way back again. Um, was one of the most, and especially if you're building a product in the industry, you should of done that five times over because it gives you incredible transferring back and across yeah. gives you an incredible amount of patience. <laughs> incredible amount of patience. Uh, you think you're a technolo technology person until you do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, before, before you transfer your 10,000, 10 million or whatever billions of dollars that you have into Celsius, just try transferring $10 across first. And making sure right. it shows up there because there's nothing worse than oh always yes. why I, I thought that was a v <laughs> oh my god i can tell you it that's like triggering to me like because i've had that happen mm. i've literally lost like a couple hundred dollars and you only do that once yeah uh, and then you never do it again so learn from our mistakes kids <laughs> absolutely it was it was thousands for me but um <laughs> my god <laughs> Now I transfer $1 or $10 and then go, okay, that's the right address. They definitely received it. So I sent my brother crypto last year on um, at like a low in the market and I sent it to, to his Jack's wallet and he's lost the key. And so right now it's not a big deal because right now it's only a couple hundred dollars. Like he is regretting it because he's a 20 something. Yeah. But God forbid he'll be one of those people crawling through, you know, a garbage dump <laughs> <laughs> trying to find his old cell phone that had a note saved on it because, you know, whatever that was, um, keep your keys safe too. Absolutely. <laughs> so keep keep your keys advice. and label them and tell your family oh where God. you put them because I, we're in early so days hard, of crypto, I got the, you know, the 12 <laughs> seed phrases. I wrote down a oh lot of God. those, but I didn't label I have, which ones they came from. So I've done this because I partner with wallets, right, all the time. So I probably have like 12 wallets. Yeah. And I've, I have this big project planner, and I know that there's at least three phrases in here that I was just jotting down at, as I did it. Mm. And given I always tested the wallets before I worked on partnership with them, so I would say like $2, $5, whatever. But – once again, years from now, who knows what that $5 is worth. <laughs> um, and I'll be searching for this project planner and be like, what happened to that one notebook that I wrote down, you know, 12 fruits in one time. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be worth millions one day. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you again, Leah. Leah Jonas, Head yeah. of Strategic Partnerships for Celsius. Thank That's Celsius with an S in the center. Find her on Celsius.network and obviously all the social medias. Fantastic. Thank you again for entertaining us and yeah. sharing a little bit about your, your passion and your excitement for this new project. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Jeremy. I had a, I had a great time. I appreciate you having me.